No matter how bad you're feeling because of anything right now, you can be rescued from that. There is this incredible feeling when it seems like your whole life has been reduced to this threat or this problem and you can't solve it, but then you remember, oh, God is here. God can save me from this. You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. That's from Psalm 91, and Psalm 91 is about you. In this video, we're gonna be doing two things. First, we're gonna break down all the good and bad stuff in the psalm. The arrows, the snare, the pestilence, the terror, the adder are describing the kinds of evil and falsity that can attack us. And the shield, the angels, the wings, and everything good are showing us how God can protect us when we turn to him as a refuge. And second, we're gonna read a Psalm 91 meditation where we can take all that stuff that we learned about God's protection and feel it in our hearts and in our lives. Hey, it's News From Heaven. Psalm 91 is a classic and universally turned to for comfort, but it's also really intense. It puts us in the middle of this picture where there's a lot going on that is frightening. And it just happens to be a picture, a very detailed picture of our spiritual growth and what it's like as God is trying to bring us out of this mindset of selfishness and blindness that is called hell into this state of trusting in him and doing what's good and true. It's called heaven. So this is picturing not only that journey, but all the obstacles that we face along the way and, and a, a window into why we have periods of struggle in our life. So let's kick it off in the beginning. The Lord being the refuge is like the iconic image of this psalm. You who live in the shelter of the Most High who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, so right under the Almighty, will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler. Let's, let's keep track. From the snare of the fowler. Okay, that's something we're up against. What else? The deadly pestilence. He will cover you Okay, then he's got these means by which he protects. He will cover you with his pinions. Under his wings, you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear. Okay, so we already had snares and pestilence. What else is coming at us? You will not fear the terror of the night or the arrow that flies by day. Or, that's not enough, the pestilence that stalks in darkness and the destruction that wastes at noonday. Man, would you not want to walk into an alley and see all that stuff? But here we are. And why, why, why not just say, hey, I'm God, you're safe, it's fine, life is not that bad. Why bring up, why are you reminding me about the pestilence and the terror of the night and the arrow? Well, it's because all that stuff occurs, sure, there are external battles that we fight of different kinds, but there's that stuff in all of us as well. If we go to our keys to the inner meaning, because you can't understand this psalm and why it's so comforting without these keys to the inner meaning, because otherwise, couldn't it be a little disturbing? But when you read it, you just feel, oh, this is great. And this is why. Just as war symbolizes times of trial, Every weapon of war symbolizes a particular aspect of trial or defense against evil and falsity. Oh, war symbolizes times of trial. There are these essential phases in our spiritual growth where we have spiritual growing pains, where what we have in us that is keeping us separate from God or, or from seeking God as our refuge is shaken and the way that that plays out in our life is this sort of chaos that is symbolized by war. So this is why, why is this story about God and the human race so full of war? Children of Israel are always getting in wars. They have wars throughout every part 
of this, even these prophetic things, the Psalms, there's conflict in the stuff in the book of Revelation, the angels are fighting dragons. It's because the war, there is this conflict that we go through in, inside of ourselves as we go through life. And that's good because that is how God is rescuing us from everything that's trying to get us down. The weapons of war symbolize a particular aspect of this trial of defense. What's the real trial? It's the defense against evil that's trying to take us down and falsity that's trying to take us down. So if you look back at all these things, it's not just trying to fill the page. These each have a meaning. And the, and once you understand what the meaning is, clicks into place. Oh yeah, I've seen that. I've been fought against. Oh, God can save me from that? I never thought. I, I didn't realize. The snare of the fowler. This is harmful thoughts and feelings that are enticing. You think about a snare, right? It's, I, when I think of a snare, I don't know exactly which kind of snare they're describing. What I think about is a little circle of rope on the ground. And when you step in it, whoosh, your leg gets caught. A snare is something that detains you. And if you think about it as some kind of inclination towards what's wrong, but that's enticing. I would, I would like this, of course, because it snares you in, right? Something that is trying to keep you somewhere that you don't want to be because you're snared. Then, so we, God can deliver us from that. So start thinking about, oh, not just, right, how many snares, how many times did you ever actually get a rope caught around your ankle? Hopefully none, probably none, but, but enticing harmful thoughts and feelings. Oh yeah. Oh, God can help me out with that. Cause there's all kinds of stuff. I, all of us have things that we, I wish I wasn't like that. I wish I could stop losing my temper. I wish I could stop doing this, but there's an appeal in it. God can save us from that snare and from the deadly pestilence. So what's the pestilence that's coming after us? The deadly pestilence is a hellish state of heart and mind. So if we see this pestilence coming for us, this is trying to envelop us in a hellish state of heart and mind, which is a state in which we enjoy what's evil. Swedenborg has this great take on it. Let's get red. How it can be red. This great take on it that to, when the pleasure of evil is felt as good, that is hell. So that's trying to get in and get us to get find, not just, oh, I've got to stand up for myself, but I enjoy attacking people. I enjoy fighting back. I enjoy eventually being predatory in whatever way. That's the deadly pestilence. The terror of the night. Look at the di dichotomy between night and day in these things. The terror of the night, which is you know, this night on coming here, is subtle, hidden falsity. So this is something that's trying to get into our head that isn't really advert that that is that we don't even know is a misconception or somebody's trying to lead us somewhere that's damaging. We don't even know that they're trying to do it. So that's the terror of the night is the false ideas that we don't understand are misleading us. But then you have in contrast the arrow that flies by day. This isn't trying to hide. We're not trying, oh, is, are there arrows coming? Yeah, there's arrows coming. So what are these? That is false ideas openly taught. That's how Swedenborg describes it. Isn't that cool? False ideas openly taught. So what the distinction and the difference there between something that you don't even know is really misleading and then when you can see, wow, this idea that's coming at me, whether it's a person teaching it or whether it's a, you know, something you've read or whether it's coming from your own mind, but you know it's false, but it's just got this brazen, like, I'm really just going to try to convince you that falsity is truth. That's the arrow that's flying by day. Remember, God can protect us from that as well. The pestilence that stalks in darkness. That what is more intimidating than the pestilence that it stalks in darkness? That is a good name for an evil. This is a subtle, oh yeah, we've got to get red there, right, right, a subtle, um, hidden evil. So this is something that is trying to creep in and be accepted in us. Like, hey, don't you want to do this? Come on, let, let's just keep going, trying to get access to our heart there, trying to get in and, and become a way of life for us. But then we've got that contrasted in our last one with the destruction that wastes at noonday. So this is, we're not trying to hide. This is evil that's openly practiced. And I, 
You know, we all get to the point where there's some things that we're not even trying to not do, even if we know that they're wrong. And we, we see in ourselves, like, I'm, I just do this, and I, I'm not, I don't really care about it. That's another kind of threat to our ability to seek God as refuge, because the Lord is the opposite of that. The Lord is is not interested in doing anything harmful to anyone. So when we adopt the, the lifestyle that's the opposite of that, you naturally push God away. Or when you see other people who are openly doing things that are evil, that's the destruction that wastes at noonday. Because it's not even trying to hide anymore. It just thinks, I can, I can get away with it. Oh, so we've got all this stuff coming at us. And it can seem overwhelming. And this, I'm giving you the containers, but you know exactly what these things are. We know what these things are in our own lives when they pop up. Whether they're coming from inside us or somebody else is bringing them to us. It's the oncoming uh, threat of harmful, scary stuff. This is what gets us down into our bunker. And what, what, what am I going to do? How am I going to survive this? So this is how we're going to survive it. Not just that there's an, an, an expansive, generalized promise that God is going to help us, but there are particular ways that God helps us. Uh, there's, it talks about the fortress, that God is a fortress and a refuge. I'll, I'll you know, show how much worse I am at drawing than the person who made this picture. If we have this little fortress here, that's truth, Swedenborg says, that's truth and faith that can withstand falsity. So that's going to help us from, we got this openly taught falsity, that's going to hit us in the fortress. If we know, if we have a, a um, framework that is robust enough that, and faith in it, so the affection for the truth, like we, not, we don't just have the truth, but we love the truth to a point where when something comes in that's trying to convince us of, that it's false, God can come into that and say, nope, you, know, you don't have to worry about that. You know that that's not really true. That that doesn't fit with this thing that you that you love and believe. The refuge of God is safe. The safety that that creates. The pinions and the wings are the protective power of divine truth, and trust in that. So look at what's right over us here, sheltering us from all of this. So this is not even just our particular version, but these are the greatest truths. The truths that spread out over the entirety of reality and that we are able to take shelter. Look, I'm right under your wings here. This is things like, hey, um, by the way, I have a plan for you. Think about how that feels when, when life seems chaotic and you feel like you're just stranded. Just remember, oh yeah, right. God has knew I was going to come along before I came along. God has a plan for where I'm going to go and what I'm going to be able to do, and God is not going to let, uh, you know, I, I'm of more value than many sparrows. We can't make a hair black or white on our heads, but God has counted them all. These are the things Jesus said. Remembering that can snap you out of this. Oh, it's me against everyone. The divine truth reminds us that no, we've, we've got a friend there. And the shield and the buckler. I got these two different kinds of protection equipment pieces and these are the Lord's protection of the goodness and the truth that's in us. There's a cool quote about this if we go back to our keys to the inner meaning. The reason a shield symbolizes protection from evil and falsity on the Lord's part, so this is the Lord protecting us from evil and falsity, and trust in Him on our part. Oh, hey, that's a cool, we'll return to that in a second. Let's finish the sentence though, is that it was a way of protecting the chest and the chest symbolizes goodness and truth. The chest symbolizes goodness because it contains the heart and truth because it contains the lungs. Wow, you see how specific, this, it's not just what we're trying to fill out your picture. These are actually all these these check boxes. I'm gonna, I'm gonna protect this part of you, I'm gonna protect this part of you. So just like physically, your, your ribs or a shield, if you are holding it, protect these two crucial organs in you, the heart and the lungs. So it is in, inside of our souls, inside of our minds, that we have what is good in us and what is true. The stuff that the Lord has already worked to get in there. Everything that we love that is honest and right and fair and upright and noble. And then everything that, that is accurate, that is this spiritual view of the reality of life. And the two, when the two are tied together, that's, that's been built up by 
God's guidance throughout your life, and God's not going to let it get destroyed when these conflicts start happening in us. When things get dark, there is this, the shield is there protecting us, protecting the heart. So this is blocking, you know, what was going to come in and making sure that this, the goodness and the truth in here are safe, because that is what God continues to build in us to bring us toward heaven. So no matter what attacks we're enduring, God has got the right defensive mechanism in there for us. Good stuff. This is starting to get exciting because we are starting to get this picture of a dynamic, powerful presence inside of us that's relevant to the things that we're going through. I got, man, what is next? I got to see what's going to happen next here. Okay, so we've got the destruction that's wasting at noonday. Everything's creeping up on us, but we've got our equipment. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your refuge, the most high your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, no scourge come near your tent. So we've changed tone here. You get this idea of, oh good, it missed me. Whatever this was didn't hit me. You do... You do pause a little bit, like, are we really supposed to be reveling in the punishment of the wicked? Ah, they got it. Look at that. They got what uh, didn't get me, but it got them. So that's a little bit of a mystery. There's no way that God is really trying to amp us up to get excited about that. So we'll have to unpack that. But this is, uh, you have made the Lord your refuge, the most high your dwelling place. Because, because. So this is, this whole psalm is describing, hey, you really get a lot of perks if you make me your refuge, if you turn to me when you're struggling. Because this is almost like an advertisement for that. Look look what I can give you. I, I really want to help you. But unless you are open to the help, I can't give it to you. But look what I could do for you. Let's take a look at w- this puzzling phrase here of you know, what's going on with all these, these, you've got these armies right beside us that have fallen. You know, you've got all these at, at the right hand. We've got all the, uh, this army's fallen over here. What does that mean? And how is that comforting? What is that pointing us toward? Our next key to the inner meaning, the destruction of these evils. What is it? It's just like everyone you have grudge against gets it in the end. Is the destruction of these evils is meant by the thousand that shall fall at your side and the destruction of the falsities by the 10,000 at your right hand. Okay. So yeah, why mention these two groups? We've got evils and falsities that are attacking us. We already saw this. All these things symbolize the arrows, the pestilence, the terror. These are all kinds of evils and falsities that are coming for us, whether that's through us in our, in our thoughts and feelings, whether it comes through other people in, in the nasty, harmful things they want to do. There, it does, it's not really about the people. It's about the evils and falsities that are trying to come through ourselves and other people. And these armies falling is saying, look, if you trust in me, doesn't matter how many of these things are arrayed against you, we'll get them. The Lord has infinite power to push back against what's evil and false. And it mentions the right hand. What's going on with the right hand? I'm left-handed. So I was like, wait, oh, okay. Oh, this is right-handed people are better equipped to this. The right hand is power fueled by goodness. Just like we have these two parts in us, the heart and the lungs, just like our, our uh, feelings and our ideas. So there are these two sides of us, one having to do with the will and the other to do with the intellect. And you see this division everywhere. This is why we're talking about there's evils which attack our heart and there's falsities which attack our mind. So the right hand is associated with the will. So this is on the feelings. So it's the power, because the hands are the symbol of power, fueled by goodness. So the goodness is in your heart. When you get goodness in your heart, that can create this power to push back. Because it's really, it's not often, you know, I get rationalized out of wanting to do something bad or thinking something bad is good. It comes out of just this feeling that, wait a second, I wouldn't want that. Or this feeling that, of course, God would protect me. God's not going to abandon me. That's not what love is. That's where you really get this power. God can come into that, fill it out, push back these armies 
where they are. And then you've got this dwelling place. So the dwelling place means heaven, where the Lord is. It also means the good of love and faith, since these compose heaven. So heaven is something that actually consists in love and faith. And what did we hear earlier? The fortress is this love and this faith. So heaven, rather than being just an afterlife destination, this is the state that we find in here. When God is protecting us, when we're in this refuge, when we have the goodness and the true things in us, that creates this state, which is heaven. And that heaven, that when we love what God loves and when we believe as much as we can the actual nature of the life God has created, that is what is impervious to all this stuff. All this terror and arrows, it's all trying to convince you that what's true isn't true and that what's good isn't good. But once we enter this state of heaven, that stuff evaporates right when it gets there. But it's not just us and God, although that's like plenty. We got some other friends making an appearance here. Oh yeah, verse 11, the angels show up. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. That's a very famous verse, by the way. Did you you ever hear that read before? He will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all of your ways. In all of your ways. Every little bit. We're starting to see some of the complexity of the protection service that God offers. I'm protecting this part of you from this, this part of you from this. And so with the angels... Hey, I'm going to send these to to make sure that you are, you just think you get some kind of full service. Ah, If somebody's going to do some uh, amazing remodeling of your house, like you won some contest and you know, oh, these pros are going to know how to do every little thing, make sure everything's up to code, make sure everything matches and all. That's the kind of service that we're getting if, if that example does it for you. Because angels are active in God's protecting of us. Actually, angels are like the tools that God uses to do the protecting. And this is the state of heaven that we're trying to get through into this process is to become an angelic tool like that ourselves, that that every, every angel went through this process and we're going through it. So it's the joy of humanity is that after you've been through all these struggles and all these dark places and you understand the arrow and the pestilence and everything that comes at you, the great joy we get after is that we are going to be able to help somebody out of that. And when you know what that dark place is like, and you've been there, and you've been lonely, and you've been afraid, and then you know, oh, I can come in there with a light. God is going to use me as a way to help get this person out of that. There's nothing, there's nothing cooler than that. There's nothing better than that. And that's what this is prepping us for. On their hands, they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against the stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder. We're stepping on snakes all of a sudden. We're stepping on lions. What do they what do they have to do with it? The young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. So what is that? It's a part of us. It's a part of you. Just like the whole psalm. The lion is something in us, and the adder is something in us, and something that then we can recognize outside of us once we've dealt with it. Because of the power of heaven's protection, when we let it in, we will be able to deal with the lion and the adder in us. And the lion is our potential for selfishness. This is the the potential for us to want to have the kind of power that a lion symbolizes over other people. This is us wanting to rule the savannah and have everyone else be there to serve us in the negative sense. There are very positive use of the God is often compared to a lion, but there's other times when the lion is the enemy. And why? It's because there can be a, this awesome lion when we look to the power of God and put God in that place. That's what the refuge is. But when we think we're the lion, when we think we are the one running it and we're the one who should be doing the fighting and we're the one to whom all the other people should respond and, and we should get what we want, that's when the lion turns on us. So you got the lion, but then you got the adder, you got the snake. And as if you're paying attention so far, you'll know, well, one just had to do with the heart and the will. The other one must have to do with ideas. The adder is the destructive power of ideas detached from goodness and love. We've all seen examples of where when you lose sight of when, what things you're scheming, the impact that has on people, 
you can end up doing horrific things. When you're detached, there there's all kinds of terrible consequences that can follow. So when we have ideas and concepts that forget that it's supposed to all be here for love, that's something that can sneak up and bite you. And that's something that other people can strike out at you with, with almost without even realizing it. But when we have God in there, God is going to keep reminding us, wait, everything you learn, everything you know, you're supposed to be using that to make the world a better place. And that's when we got this stuff underfoot. It's no problem. All right, so situation's looking up. We are starting to understand just how much power there is in looking to the Lord as a refuge, how effective that power is at pushing back all kinds of enemies. We've got the enemies in our heart and mind. We've got the enemies in uh, false ideas coming in. We've got all kinds of protection. Where do we go from here? Now we start to get into the promise. Those who love me, I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. Oh, that's it? You just got to know the name? What's that mean? We'll come back to that. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. It sounds like a lot of good stuff. Of course, who wouldn't want to get answered by God? Have you ever felt like you're calling out and you don't get the answer? So how do we get that? Oh yeah, I wouldn't mind having you here with me when there's trouble. Oh, rescuing and honoring. This is like too much. All of that is contingent on knowing the name. How do we know the name of God? What is that? Well, we've got a key that can help us with that. It is common in all divine worship for a person to first wish desire and pray, and for the Lord to reply, instruct, and effect. Okay, so this is the rhythm that we have with the Lord. We're wishing for help. We start to really want it. Like we're, we're, we're understanding we need help. We're starting to really want it. And then we're taking the action of praying. Whatever, whether your hands are folded or not, this is the asking. It's the asking. It's the looking outside self which is looking to the Lord as the refuge because you are free to go and you've got these challenges and arrows are flying at you and all that. And you can try to take it on yourself. And most of us have been for a long time. And when that's not working, that's usually when we think of, okay, why well, I, I need help. It's almost a, it's a trope to have, okay, well, I never talked to God for so long, but, but are you there in like a movie? Right? So that's the rhythm now we start to actually ask. We start to turn to the Lord for a refuge. And so what does God do back? Reply, instruct, and effect to mirror that. A person does not otherwise accept anything divine. So if we can get to where we can somehow hear this, we can get into this rhythm, the refuge. Moreover, in the word, we frequently read that the Lord answers when people call on him or cry out to him. Yeah, it's in saying that in this psalm here. And that he gives to people when they ask. Yet even so... It is the Lord who gives people to ask and what they should ask for. And the Lord knows it, therefore, beforehand. Wait a second. Why are we even doing it? If you already knew, why are we doing it? And this gets at the crux of what it means to make the Lord your refuge. But it is still the Lord's will that people first ask in order that people may do so as though on their own and that the petition may thus be assigned to them. Because we have to do what? We have to make the Lord our refuge. That's what it is. We have to say, I'm going to, I need you. Because we can go through all this. We can even win. If we, if we somehow pushed back one wave of this, or, or seemed to push it back on our own, because God really is the only one who has any power against all this negative stuff anyway. But if we seem to push it back, we, no progress would be made. The, tri- the spiritual trial that we are in wouldn't do anything, because the whole point, getting to that heaven, is getting us to understand, oh, this, this whole time, my, my help, the actual one who can do anything good, and who, can, who actually has the only good plan for where my life could go, that's God. And that grasping that, That is heaven. Grasping that is the prerequisite for heaven. So if we can get there through this process, that's what we come away with. That's this prize that we're starting to talk about here. Those who love me, I will deliver. That's what it is 
that's we're starting to move into loving God. Because if we ask, what does God want? Then we start to love the things that God loves. Because you can sit here and ask, well, you make me pout. Make, you can ask, f- the, li- the lion can be asking through you. If, you're, if it's, you just want to be better than everyone else, you can ask God, well, give me this promotion. Give me this, uh, make this person that I don't like fall on hard times. If the, or the adder can be asking. If you're just thinking, I want this without, without understanding the big picture and how you know, we're responsible to, to love other people and do everything that Jesus commanded, that stuff can be asking through. But if you, we allow God to teach us, okay, what, what do you want? That's when we start to love God. So for God to answer, for God to answer is this influx or this inspiration or perception that we start to get when we are looking for it, when we actually honestly believe that there is something outside of us that can be our refuge, when we bring that humility in, because the humility is what protects us, because all the hell, all that negative stuff is trying to come in and bank on the fact that we have this pride they can exploit, and we have this arrogance they can exploit. Know my name. The name is the quality of God. So you can go after God and say, oh, well, God is is somebody who is vengeful and uh, and is more like the lion in the negative sense. But to understand that God is love. God is love your enemies and everything that Jesus taught. To know the quality of that, if we understand that that's what God is, that's how we can start to know, let God ask through us for the things that we really need. Because then we know really who we're asking. And then to wrap it up, we're already in a good state, but look at how, look at this promise here at the end. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. And the meaning of that is that there will be no fear from the hells. So we, all this stuff that can come at us, all the pestilence, everything we were talking about before, all this stuff in your life that is frightening you, because all unrest is from evil and falsity. Everything that's trying to attack us is not is from hell, because actually what God makes is good when the divine has been made one with the human. This is the process. We learn to love God. We look to God as a refuge. We are forming this partnership. We are becoming one. You're still you, but you can be in the Lord. You can be knowing that we have this intimate partnership going forward. Then there's no fear from hell. Then we really feel like, oh, the Lord is my refuge. And this long life, this salvation, the satisfaction is this divine heaven state of mind, which leads to peace and safety. When you really not only believe that the Lord is doing anything, but trust that doing everything, but trust that God will give you the right things. Instead of saying, well, I, I need this to turn out like this for me. I need to get my will enacted here. What if this happens? I know you're going to bring me to where I need to go because that's what you do. You are my refuge. And it's in our times of trial that we really come to understand that. Okay, before we go into the meditation, I gave you the generic framework for the psalm, but it really is most powerful when we're looking at it in our own lives. Like, how does, where is the particular adventure of my life showing up in this? So I want to give you a little example, or I'll, I'll show you a couple of places where I see myself in Psalm 91. Looking at the snare of the fowler. And there's a, I've had a million Fowler snares on me, but I'm thinking to when I was uh, you know, like a mid-teenager or something like that, and we used to go and do like sort of petty but obnoxious property crime. Like we would try to like sneak, sneak uh, over uh, into people's pools, I think I mentioned before. We would like do, do little things, like we st- stole some hood ornaments off of cars, which is super obnoxious. And it was this feeling of, oh, this is fun. You're not thinking at all about what it's going to do, and that's the... So we had a combination here. We had the, the Fowler snare, but also the adder was coming in because I was not thinking. I just had this idea, oh, I want to go and do something dangerous you know, because it felt good, right, from the lion. But I didn't think at all about what this actually does to people. So it was this entrapment of like, oh, the danger and the fun of it all pulling me into doing things that, that had bad consequences for people. But there was this really potent example recently of 
needing the Lord as a refuge. Uh, so I was having this sort of mental breakdown. I was having this constant worry about my health that had come after some episodes I actually addressed on the channel earlier where I was going through some significant health issues. I had like major acid reflux and those sorts of things. But I started to get so psyched out by it that I just thought something was, even after those symptoms subsided, I thought something is wrong with me. Something is wrong with me. And I remember I had this moment in my basement where it was just this visceral, I could feel like the arrows were out and flying. Like I was here, I was on this battlefield. And actually the, the message, which had gone from being the terror by night, that it's just sort of a subliminal thing, into being the arrows by day was, something is seriously wrong with you. You can just feel it. You can feel it. something is wrong with you. And this was just flying at me. I remember at the time, just it was really distinct just having to say, God exists. God is real. God is real. And I was having to say that to these thoughts and feelings that were coming in and convincing me, like, you, look, look at how you feel. Something is really wrong. And I just remember this moment of intense clash. And the only thing that I could really say was, oh, no, God is real. God is real. I was sitting there like those were my wings at the time. God exists. And because it wasn't true what the arrows that were flying, because later I got some, you know, metabolism tests done and everything came back great. There wasn't something wrong with me, but it was pestilence and, and uh, arrows and, and everything else trying to fly in there. And at that time, I, I couldn't rationalize my way out of it. I couldn't think, well, probably I'm all right. And once the test came in, that was nice, but it was really just this idea that God exists. And that was the time when I just felt it so distinctly. This, this clash is happening. I'm right here in the middle and it's only these kinds of shields and these kinds of wings that are, that are keeping me safe. Okay, so there's a couple of times I see myself in the Psalm. Where do you see yourself? Start to think about that and feel it uh, as we go through the text and with what we know about this being this very detailed sort of love letter to us from God and this promise of protection. Where are you in this psalm? You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence he will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, or the arrow that flies by day, or the pestilence that stalks in darkness, or the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your refuge, the Most High your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, no scourge come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder. The young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Those who love me, I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. Mm -hmm.